Now my text this morning is the book of Hebrews chapter 6. You're turning your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6. And this is a, the second part of a message entitled The Danger of Apostasy. The Danger of Apostasy. And I will, uh, I will explain that in just a moment, but this really deals with the first uh, eight verses of Hebrews chapter 6. And I want to just read through it. Hebrews 6 and verse 1, where the writer of Hebrews, in encouraging the people of God who believe, who claim to believe the truth, to grow in grace and in knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, to endeavor to cling to Christ. And he says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. And as I explained last week, that doesn't mean leave them behind and forget about them. It means build on them. That's what he's talking about. The foundation, if we're saved by the grace of God, the foundation has been laid. But... We are to endeavor to build upon that foundation by growing in grace and in knowledge. And of course, we know we don't do that by our own power or our own goodness or even our own will. It's by the power, goodness, and will of God. And he says, let us go on unto perfection. That's completion. That's uh, 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 believing in, in Christ, clinging to Christ, and seeing him as our complete full and only refuge. And that's what that psalm was about, Psalm 62. He only is my refuge. I shall not be moved. Now there are a thousand and one or million and one things that would move us away from Christ. And we know that if it weren't for the sovereign power and goodness and grace of God, we would be moved. We would be moved off of Christ. Because God's power and grace saves us, keeps us, and will bring us to glory. It's all of grace. It's not by our power or our goodness. He says, let us go on to perfection. What is the completion of this doctrine of Christ? It's to bring a sinner, by God's grace, to faith in Christ, and what he mentions here, repentance from dead works. Look, he says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Now, what are dead works? Dead works in the Bible refers to the religious efforts of men and women to, to be saved by those works. That's what that's talking about. Dead works are uh, the acts of morality, devotion, sincerity, religion that, that men and women who, are, who claim to believe the gospel but who are not who, who uh, are trying to establish their own righteousness before God. You see, Christ is our righteousness. Christ is the only one who fulfilled the law. If you're seeking to be accepted with God by your law keeping, that's a dead work. Here specifically, it refers to the, to the works under the Jewish law because these Hebrew Christians were being tested tempted and even tortured to forsake Christ whom they claim to believe and go back under the law. And some of them had forsaken Christ. They fell away. That's what apostasy is. And we'll talk about that. But go on. He says in verse 2, a doctrine of baptism. That's the ceremonial washings. What, what, what do we believe? We don't believe that any... any uh, Physical water or ceremonial washing can cleanse us from sin. Baptism. Baptism is a confession of something that's already taken place. The baptismal waters do, do not cleanse us from our sin. What cleanses us from sin? There's only one thing. The blood of Christ. I'll not be moved. He says laying on of hands. That was like the, the priest putting their hand on the sacrifice. It was typical of faith in Christ. I believe in Christ. I submit to him as my righteousness before God. I shall not be moved. He's my high tower. He's my refuge. He's my rock, you see. Of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. 
How do I know that I'll be raised from the dead? Because Christ was raised from the dead. He's the first fruits of them that's left. Righteousness was established and he came out of that grave. And that same righteousness which is imputed, charged to my account, will bring me out of that grave. It's already given me spiritual life. I shall not be moved. When I stand before God at judgment, I'll stand there washed in the blood, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Enough said. Oh, but you got to do your works to get a bigger mansion than me. That's false religion, folks. That's false religion. That's another gospel. And he says in verse 3, and this will we do if God permit. This is all according to God's will. He didn't say this will we do if you'll cooperate. If God permits. If this is God's will, it's going to happen. His will is never thwarted. The Bible says that he does what he wills among the armies of the earth. He worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. And if he permits God, thy will, what are we to pray when we pray? Thy will be done. Isn't that right? I know a lot of things I pray for that I don't get. Because God has not been, been pleased to give me those things. And you know what? He knows better than me what I need. Thy will be done. So here we come to these verses. Verse 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away. Now that word fall away, that's apostatize, apostasy. It's impossible if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Now we'll stop right there. Apostasy. What do these verses teach? Well, as I said last week, you have to interpret Scripture using the right rules of interpretation, and one of the main rules is the rule of context. You have to look at this verse, these verses, in the immediate context of this chapter, in the, in the context of the whole book of Hebrews, and then in the context of the whole Bible. And what does the Bible the very gospel itself tell us about salvation. When God saves sinners by His grace, it says this. It says he, will, he saves His people by His grace. It says He keeps His people by His grace. John chapter 10, Jude 24, 25, Psalm 62, and m many more. And He will bring them to glory by His grace. What did Christ say in John chapter 6, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. And this is the will of him that sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose what? Nothing, no one, but raise him up again at the last day. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, they follow me. They'll never perish. You say, well you're just preaching once saved, always saved, like those old Baptists do. I'm preaching this. And once God saves a sinner by His grace, there is absolutely no possibility that that sinner could ever be lost again. And if you believe, I'm just going to tell you plainly now, if you believe that He can be lost, that's the product of a false gospel. Salvation conditioned on sinners and not on Christ alone. Well, what does it say here if He falls away? What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean He loses salvation. Now, there are three interpretations of this passage. One of them denies the gospel and denies the rest of Scripture. And that's the idea that people go to this verse and they say, well, see there? Look at all it says about him. Once enlightened, tasted of the heavenly gift, made partakers of the Holy Ghost, tasted the good word of God and the powers of the... If that doesn't describe salvation, what does? This describes, what, what this describes is this. A person may have heard a lot of the true word of God, have made a profession of faith, but then still among the company of, uh, 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 and be still among the company of believers in, in the vicinity, but he may actually never have truly believed and in the gospel, believed in Christ. 
never come to a saving knowledge of the truth. This shows how close a person can come, how much a person can, can profess and still not ever have been saved. <clears throat> and those who interpret this the same way they can lose salvation, number one, you've got to deny the context of this chapter, the context of Hebrews, and the context of the whole Bible. The second interpretation of this is what we call a hypothetical. Some believe this, that what the writer of Hebrews is presenting here is a, is a hypothetical situation. He's saying, well, if it were possible for sinners who are saved to lose that salvation, and it's not, but if it were possible, they could never be brought again to repentance. I don't believe that's what this is preaching, what it's teaching. What I believe is teaching is just what I said, that people can give mental agreement some open profession of the truth and really not believe it. And if they fall away from it, if they apostatize from it, what does that tell us? Well, now, we, last week we went to this verse, but go again, with the, just as an example, 1 John chapter 2. He tells us plainly what's happened here. Christ told us plainly in the parable of the soils. Remember the, the thorny ground hearer and the stony ground hearer? They gave mental agreement, but then they left. The thorny ground left because of love of this world and the love of riches. The stony ground here left because of persecution over the word. That's what the word of God brings persecution, the scripture teaches us. Well, the stony ground here gave mental, it says he received it anon. That's the word the King James Version uses. You know what anon means? It means now. <laughs> it means immediately. In other words, they heard it, they latched onto it quickly without counting the cost, and when persecution came, they left it. They never believed it. The only ones who believe it are the good ground hearers. That's the, the sinner whom God has given a new heart, a new spirit, and brought to faith in Christ. But look at verse 19. Talking about the spirit of Antichrist, it says in 1 John 2, they went out from us, they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Leaving, forsaking Christ for a person who has claimed to believe in the true Christ. You know, there's a million false gospels. That's not what he's talking about here. There's only one true gospel. He's talking about somebody sitting under the true gospel and claiming to believe it, but then leaves it and turns his back on Christ and really calls him accursed. The Spirit of God shows us plainly that there's some people who have what appear to be heavenly gifts who have no grace in their hearts. People who have experienced much, professed much, demonstrated much in religion, yet no true faith and repentance. No real love for Christ and His truth. And the foundation of repentance has not been laid by God in their hearts. He says in verse 4, he says it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift. They were privileged to hear the true gospel. Do you know that's a rarity today? You say, well, I thought all these churches preached the gospel. You better perk up and listen. You know what the most popular false gospel today is? I'll put it to you in this phrase. Salvation conditioned on sinners. That's a false gospel. What is the true gospel? Salvation conditioned on Christ alone who fulfilled all those conditions and secured the salvation of his people. That's the truth. These people were privileged to hear the true gospel. They professed to believe it. The Bible says the natural man cannot believe it savingly. He won't, he won't receive it savingly. Tasting the heavenly gifts and the powers of the world to come is not salvation. Salvation is eating the bread of life, drinking the water of life, which is Christ. Salvation is not in miraculous gifts, but in immutable grace, sovereign grace, based on the righteousness of the Savior. Salvation is not in feelings, emotions, or even experiences, no matter how great and how life-changing they may be. Salvation is coming to Christ. 
in faith, God-given faith and repentance of dead works, leaving all else behind, counting it but lost that you may win Christ and be found in Him. That's what salvation is. I'm going to talk more about that next week when we talk about things that accompany salvation. Salvation is being made a new creature wherein our standard of good and evil has changed. You remember back up in chapter 5 there? Look at verse 14. He says, But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In other words, when God brings a sinner to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, do you know that's the first time you really understand the difference between good and evil when it comes to salvation? Let me show you an example of that. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Here's talking about the new creation, the new creature. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verse 16. All right, wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Now what that's saying is you can't, what that's saying, you can't judge by outward appearance. We don't know anybody after the flesh. We don't know saved or lost after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Now how did, how did Paul, before he was converted, before he was brought to faith in Christ and repentance of dead works, how did he judge Jesus of Nazareth? Judged him to be a malefactor, an imposter, a blasphemer, didn't he? What was he? Where was he going on the road to Damascus? To a prayer meeting? No, he was going to kill Christians, arrest Christians. His goal in life was to wipe the name of Jesus of Nazareth off the face of the earth. He's the same man who held the coats of those who stoned Stephen, a bold gospel preacher. Because of his judgment of good and evil. He looked at Jesus of Nazareth as being evil. And looked at his Jewish brethren as being good. But he says, don't think like that anymore. He says in verse 17, he said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature or new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Well, what's passed away, Paul? We don't judge anybody after the flesh now. The issue of saved and lost is not how you appear to me after the flesh or how I appear to you after the flesh. I hope, now let, let me say this, I hope that our appearance doesn't hinder our testimony. Sometimes it does. It? But that's not the issue. You know what the issue is? Well, he tells you there in the rest of 2 Corinthians 5, how can God be reconciled to sinners and sinners reconciled to God? What is your ground of salvation? What is your ground of reconciliation before God? What is it? Specifically. Well, I'll tell you what my ground is. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. You see, it's not your works. It's not, your, it's not even your faith. My faith is not my ground of reconciliation. Christ is. My faith drives me to Him. That's God-given faith. You see the difference? It's the blood of Christ that makes the difference. It's the righteousness of Christ that makes the difference between saved and lost. And no matter what you profess to believe, if that's not your foundation and your ground, then my friend, you've never come to a saving knowledge of the truth. Back here in Hebrews chapter 6, he mentions how how they have been made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. You know, in the beginning of the New Testament, there were sign gifts given by which the word preached was given visible authority of God. Could an unbeliever have those? Well, think about Judas Iscariot. You suppose that when they went out and preached the word and, and uh, did miracles, which the apostles did, that they all were able to do it except Judas? Well, that would have tipped them off. Well, what's wrong with Judas? You remember when Christ at the supper, he said, there's one sitting here who's going to betray me? They didn't say, well, I know it's Judas because he's never done anything with other things. No, they said, is it I? Am I the one? 
They were surprised that it was Judas. Yet the Bible says that Judas was a man of perdition, son of perdition. Think about, think about Matthew 7, 21 through 23. What did those false professors say? Lord, Lord, haven't we what? Preached in your name. Lord, haven't we cast out demons? Lord, haven't we done many wonderful works? And he said, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Now, most preachers will come to you and they'll say, well, now those fellows just weren't sincere about that. And I say, well, how do you know that? They're pleading at a judgment. That seems pretty sincere to me. And let me ask you a question. Are you more sincere than they are? Are you sure of that? Seems to me like if you think you are, you're pretty proud of your sincerity. And let me ask you this. How much sincerity passes the mustard here? You don't know, do you? You know what their problem was? They preached in his name. They cast out demons. They did many wonderful works. Their problem was is that that's what they were pleading as their righteousness before God. And I've told you a lot this. I've preached this gospel for over 30 years now. But I don't plead my preaching as my ground of salvation. I don't plead my preaching as having any meritorious value before God. I plead one thing. Christ crucified and risen from the dead. His blood, his righteousness alone. That's the issue. You know, in Matthew chapter 24, the Lord tells his disciples that the greatest sign of the nearness of his coming is false Christians and false Christianity. In other words, they'll be Christian in name only, but they'll reject the doctrine of Christ. Paul in, the, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 called that the falling away. In other words, generally as we near the second coming of Christ, what is generally in the world known as Christianity will not be Christianity at all. It's a false Christianity. How, do you, how can you tell the difference? Well, what does the Bible say? Remember in 2 John verse 9, he said, He that transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Talking about people who claim to be Christians, but they don't abide, continue in the truth, the teachings of Christ. And he that hath, he that abideth in the doctrine has both the Father and the Son. What is the doctrine of Christ? It's the doctrine of his person. Who is Jesus Christ? He's God manifest in the flesh. That's who he is. Every bit God, every bit man without sin. A friend of mine told me he asked a fellow at work, he said, Do you believe that Jesus is God and the who claimed to be a Christian, he, he thought up a little bit. He said, well, he's the son of God. Yes, he's the son of God, but he is God. Every bit God. He's not a lesser God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I can't explain the Trinity to you. I know it's true. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's who Jesus Christ is. And then what is the doctrine of Christ? It's the doctrine of his finished, accomplished work. Not just that he died. Not just that he was buried, not just that he arose again, that's included, but what did he accomplish when he died, was buried and arose again? What do the scriptures say? Remember I quoted earlier, he made an end of sin. If he made an end of it, then you can't be condemned. He finished the transgression. If he finished the transgression, then it cannot be imputed to his people. He brought in everlasting righteousness. That's what's imputed to his people and they must be saved. And he's able to save to the uttermost that come unto God by him. That's what that psalm was teaching. I shall not be moved. Why shall I not be moved? Because God won't let me. He's, he won't, no one can pluck them out of my father's hand, Christ said. You say, well, people can't go that far and not be saved. Well, what about Demas? He walked with Paul and then left him. What about the man Diotrephes in 3 John who claimed to be a Christian and was made an elder in the church but would not receive brethren? What about wolves in what? Sheep's clothing. That's false preachers. 
They appear in sheep's clothing. What about, turn to 1 Corinthians 13. Look at this with me. Listen to what it says here. First Corinthians 13. This is called the love chapter. But look how it starts out. He says in verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity. That's love. Now that's godly love. That's love for Christ and his truth and his people. That springs from faith in Christ and repentance of dead works. We're together on that, you see. We're not having to argue about that. That's not a debatable point. We're not having to continually instruct people in these areas that are settled in their minds by the power of the Holy Spirit. They've been brought to love of Christ. And if you love Christ, you love his truth. Isn't that right? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. All right, he says, though I've become a sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. Verse 2, and though I have the gift of prophecy, that's foretell the future, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, have not this love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth thee nothing. Is that possible? Well, I suppose it is, or it wouldn't have been put in the scriptures. Satan, you know, Satan can counterfeit miracles. Turn to 2 Thessalonians 2. 2 Thessalonians 2. This is where Paul speaks of that falling away, that apostasy. And what he's talking about here, li listen to what he says in this passage. It's a real eye opener. He says in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1, he says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Christ is coming back. You know, you hear people today say, I believe Christ is coming back uh, uh, in our day. Well, I, I don't know that he is. We don't know when he's coming back. You, you might remember the preacher out in California who kept predicting different days. And I mean, I, I never forget one time I had a guy show up at the church up in Ashland, had a T-shirt on, had a date on it. And I said, what? The, I said, is that, is that the, your birthday? He said, no, that's the day Christ is coming back. And you know what? He was wrong. I don't know what he did. He had a bunch of those. T I don't know what he did with them, all those T-shirts. We don't know. We know he's coming. And we know there are signs that indicate the nearness of his coming. And as I said, read Matthew 24. Remember what he said? There'll be people coming saying, I'm the Messiah. And then there'll be false prophets come and say, here, here, we're preaching Christ. There's Christ. He said, don't believe. You know what he said? He said, some of them will be so close that if it were possible, they could see, deceive the very elect, God's chosen people. For whom Christ died. Thank God it's not possible for the elect to be deceived unto perdition. But they'll come that close. Well, Satan can counterfeit miracles. Look here, he says in 2 Thessalonians 2, don't be troubled. He says in verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away, an apostasy first. And that man of sin... Antichrist, which I believe is speaking of Satan, be revealed the son of perdition. No, I'm not going to get into that today. I'll preach on that another time. But here's what he's saying. That which started out in the New Testament as identifying the church of Christ and what Christianity really is, as it goes closer to the end time, there will be a great apostasy from the truth. As I said before, what is generally known throughout the world as Christian will be apostate. It'll be Christian in name only. They'll, they'll claim to be Christian, but they'll deny the doctrine of Christ. They'll compromise the doctrine. And they'll show many wonderful works. Look down at 2 Thessalonians 2. Look at verse 9. This apostasy. 
brought about by Satan and his false preachers. It says, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Things that seem wonderful to our eyes. But it's a lie. I've told people today, you know, that you have these preachers on TV who claim to be healers. And, you know, their healing is always up to scrutiny. You know, when Christ healed somebody or the disciples healed somebody, there was absolutely no doubt that that person was healed to the crowd. That blind man in John chapter 9, he'd been blind from birth. And they didn't say, well, let's get, the, let's get the newspaper guys out here to check this out. No, they knew he was blind. There was no question about any of those miracles. But these guys going around today, you know, you'll find that some, they're charlatans, you know, they have people put, posted out in the audience and stuff like that. They'll send you miracle water, drink it, you know, all that stuff. Let me tell you how you expose a false preacher. Don't argue with him about his miracles. Ask him what he preaches. If he preaches a lie, I don't care if he raises the dead. He's a false preacher. You believe that? That's what the Bible says. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there's no light in them. Look on verse 10, 2 Thessalonians 2. He says, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. This is an unrighteousness that is deceptive. The natural man can't see this. This is not natural conscience judgment here. This is something that has to be revealed for us to see it. In them that perish. And why do they perish? Now look at it. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now go back to Hebrews 6. He says in verse 6, If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. He's talking about people who have apostatized. They fell away. They turned their back on Christ and crucifying Him again, putting Him to, to an open shame, means they call Christ accursed. That's how far they go. That's how they had to go back into their Judaism, their false religion. It's the same with people today. If you're sitting here and you claim to believe the gospel, but you... you uh, fall away from that truth, apostatize from it, say, I don't believe, I know a man up in Ohio who, who sat under a gospel preacher for five years who is now an avowed atheist. That's who he's talking about here. I went to his wedding when he claimed to be a Christian. He claimed to believe sovereign grace, claimed to believe everything we believe here. And now he's an avowed atheist. He denies God, denies Christ. That, that man was never converted. He, would, he had never been brought by God to faith in Christ and repentance. He had never submitted to the righteousness of Christ as his only ground of salvation. That's apostasy. Well, it says here, it's impossible to renew them again. Well, let me read verses 7 and 8, and I'm going to pick up on this next week, but listen to what it says. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them, by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. What's he saying there? Remember the parable of the soils? This is like the good ground here. This, he's saying here, if God saves you, it's going to bring forth this fruit. But he says in verse 8, But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. You may claim to be saved. You may claim to be a Christian. But if all that comes out of that is thorns and briars, and, then it's an empty, empty claim. Empty religion. God's elect shall not and cannot fall away and perish. They cannot perish because God will not. First of all, we said God will not charge them with their sin. God charged them with the righteousness of Christ. God has given him his spirit to indwell them, bring them to Christ, and keep them looking to Christ. Christ is in interceding on our behalf at the throne of God. We cannot lose that which he has gained. We can lose what we claim if it's merely a claim.
but we cannot lose that which Christ has gained. We stand before God washed in his blood, clothed in his righteousness, and that can never be taken away. I shall not be moved. <laughs>